When you grow up down here, you know the Mel Fisher story. Once it gets in your blood, it never leaves you. All these green, to see all the green dots here? All magnetometer anomalies. At least that gives us a direction to head. You're already 25 miles west of Key West. A couple of them, Ollie. There's six of them floating on the surface right here. Got them. Docile is not exactly the word I'd use. I've always heard about the shrimp boats. Doesn't take long. And it was instant surface action. Look how big that bonita is, though. Huge. You no, know, whenever you're not looking for an amberjack, they're they're bound to show up. My name is Ali Husseini. I grew up in Southern California and now operate one of the largest sport fishing websites in the world. Just another day at the office. office not yours. <laughs> I'm Rush Malt. I got you. What you seeing? Florida Keys native and career fishing guide for the past 20 years. When I come out to California, you can let me catch all the 300 pound tunas. Our passion is our profession, and we know there's more to fishing than just the catch. We explore the people, places, and species that make up the culture of fishing. They sank because of a chaotic event like a hurricane or a northeastern or something like that okay. that drove the ships into the beach. And then they, as soon as they started bumping bottom, they loosened up, all their ballast fell out, the ships got lighter, and the treasure and their ship just got pushed all the way to the beach. The two most famous wrecks here in South Florida, without question, are the Atosha and the Santa Margarita. When the Santa Margarita got driven into the quicksands, it had bumped bottom before it got there. We've got ballast. I remember first hearing about the Atosha when I was in grade school. You know, further to the south of the main pile. And uh, trail. yeah, it's just, you follow that trail, you get on that trail and. These were both Spanish galleons like you read about when you were a kid that were attempting to leave Cuba with a load of basically plundered treasure and head back to the motherland. The Margarita Trail is pretty wide. It's about 1800 feet wide. So the story about this treasure is really incredible. I remember in the early 80s when this treasure was found and the name that is synonymous with these two ships is a guy named Mel Fisher. Mel was a dude who knew he was on the trail of this stuff. He begged, borrowed, did whatever he had to kind of live his dream. I mean, I think it's safe to say he was obsessed with this treasure. And in the end, Mel found the payday. My dad and Mel Fisher got hooked up, so now I'm on the, uh, I don't know, I'm eight, eight years old, 10 years old. So I'm on the beach playing with, with Mel's kids, Taffy Fisher, in front of Kip's cabin while our parents are out there finding treasure and wow. come home from school or I'd be doing homework and, and my dad and the crew would come in and they'd dump a bunch of silver coins. And Dan Porter's a guy who grew up pretty much in this treasure culture. Once it gets in your blood like that, it, it, it never leaves you. When you talk to Dan, you can tell this is his passion, this is his career work. That's what our target is for 2017, this search area here, we're moving the whole operation to the west. To be in this line of work that Dan and Mel, and there's hundreds of other guys that have been involved in the operations over the years, you gotta be dedicated and you almost gotta be a little crazy. But all these green, to see all the green dots here? Yeah. These are all magnetometer anomalies. So I've got over 6,000 mag magnetometer anomalies. All these blue ones on here, this is a different one. These are, are search areas, but I've got search areas down here is off that drop off you were talking about, Rush. Mm -hmm. We found the uh, gold chalice. That piece right there was found way up here. Ideal crew is five people. It was really cool to get down and see Dan's operation, get to walk all over the boat, check it out. You know, we've, we've set the boat up to be comfortable and stay at sea. Um, Longest trip we did out here is 19 days. All right, looks good. Look, go ahead and let it. Uh, another thing right. that you learn is in this part of the ocean, the bottom changes constantly. It's mostly made up of sand. There's strong, heavy currents that are hitting the keys here. It's an area called the quicksands for a reason. And this treasure, instead of being in one spot in a treasure chest like you imagine as a kid, is actually scattered over miles and miles of sand. And it's not sitting on top of the sand. It's actually encased in the sand, and that's where Dan comes in. When you check out Dan's boat, one of the first things you can't help but notice is these giant tubes on the back of the boat. And what these tubes are for is Dan can actually lower the tubes down to where the bent portion of the tube covers the prop. And it uses the thrust from the prop and it directs it down. 
And what that does is it allows Dan and his crew to dust the bottom of the ocean. The treasure is actually buried anywhere under, you know, a foot to six, eight feet of sand. This thrust pushes the sand away to reveal the true bottom, which is a mix of limestone or coral or whatever. And a lot of times they're gonna find the treasure down embedded in that hard bottom. He is a very inviting guy. As soon as we stepped foot on the boat, you know, he made us feel welcome. And he told us, hey, if we can ever kind of team up and help you guys out doing a shoot. Anytime, man, it works great, you know, cause we're, we're out there, we're either staying on the wreck site at night or we're in the Marquesas. And anytime you want to come out and you know satellite up with us and come on out, bring some steaks, whatever, we'll hang out on the boat at night. You guys can use me as a mothership, and that is what ignited the idea. This is our gift store where you can get the authentic and original uh, artifacts, coins, silver. All this stuff has been recovered. All this stuff's been recovered. It's all from the the Atocha, the Santa Margarita. Okay, and those are the two big finds that Mel Fisher had. Yep. Sank in uh, 55 feet of water. The margarita went down at about 25. Were they on anchor at the time? Nope, they were dragging anchor. Uh, they were trying right to get anchor so they could turn into it. Now there's a museum that sort of tells the tale. Going into Mel Fisher's treasures is like going into a time machine. Very exciting days down there, and that's what, it, what it's all about. That's the treasure that uh, dreams are made of right there. That's got to be better than drugs, man, finding that <laughs> stuff. I mean, you that's got to be so exciting. Now, walking through that museum, obviously interesting to anybody, right? This might be the coolest thing I've ever held in my hands. Wow. 400 year old. How long is it? 28 feet. Jeez. Jeez. All that kind of stuff that you you know you dream about as a kid. So that's another piece of contraband. And one of the thing about these wrecks is there is so much contraband that uh, on the margarita they've actually recovered 220 percent more gold than was actually manifested on the wreck right now. To walk through that museum with Dan, he knows this so intimately. So the Cinta Belt was found right in here, the Bank of Spain, they found a lot of treasure. They're working way up here in the north end on the area called the Carpenter's Trail right now with the Magruder and the Dare and those boats. And the stories he was able to relay, it, it was, I mean, really, it was a lifetime experience. It was awesome. Local Knowledge is brought to you by Penn, let the battle begin. Yeti Coolers, built for the wild. The Florida Keys and Key West, come as you are. BDOutdoors.com and Evan Rood. The Slammer 3 uses a fully machined brass gear system. And what that gives you is extreme durability and extreme cranking power. Dura drag material is the smoothest, most durable drag material we've ever used. Yeah, that's him. With seals on the drag system, around the main shaft and pinion gear, and the body, the Slammer 3 is sealed to our highest standard yet. The future of boating is here. Now get all the efficient performance of an Evinrude E-Tech G2 in the new 150, 175, and 200 horsepower. Fuel economy is everything. I was really shocked how fuel efficient it is. Anywhere from 40 to 50 miles further on a tank of fuel. All day on the water. I told my wife, I said, you know, I can't think of the last time I filled up. It's more money in the bank for me. The best in class fuel economy of the Evinrude E-Tech G2 is now available from 150 to 300 horsepower. To learn more, visit Evinrude.com. We're just getting started. We lost a day getting ready to go. Sea Reaper, Sea Reaper, come on, Dan. One of the things that we always want to do, you know, me and Rush is kind of explore some of this stuff that he hasn't looked at in a long time. Growing up in Key West, Rush knows a lot of spots that people don't do, but some of those are out of range to check out. Hey, Rush, you guys want to uh, power ball up right here? And what's your plan? Yeah, that'd be great if we could uh, come to you, transfer some of this stuff over to your boat. And 
because this could serve us as a mothership and Dan was so happy to host us, it really got the wheels spinning for me and Rush. Being able to sleep out there at the Marquesas is a great way to get a good jump on the day. At least that gives it a direction ahead. Are they always there? Yeah, they're shrimping, but sometimes they're further east or west. You're already 25 miles west of Key West. You already got an hour start. 13 miles from here. So that's kind of right by that wreck I wanted to go to anyway. I got to look at the direction that wreck was, but I want to say that's pretty close. Does this wreck, I mean, is there more of it going this way or is this all that we're seeing the rest of it's gone? This is it. No, it's a full, that's a full ship right there. There's a stern right there. See the round stern? The Gulf is literally covered in shipwrecks. There's tons of them. Oh, that's a huge mass for such a little boat. Uh-huh. I thought this thing was like a hundred. Oh, there's a little feet. cove right there. One little guy. On this particular trip, ironically, we returned to the same wreck where I caught my first cobia. In the middle, oh, here's a couple of them, Ollie. There's six of them floating on the surface right here. Where's Right, 10 o'clock. There's nothing rigged. Put, just hook a hook, a bait on one of those hooks. You know, we kind of got tipped off to it because Dan had passed by it and had seen some cobias on it and we weren't too far away. Look how they're just daisy chaining around with the kudas. Right on top of each other. Where at, this way? You don't oh, see the I brown see. fish swimming on the surface? I was. I thought they were well, off the bottom. Try and pick a bigger one, there's a big one. Got him? Yep, got him. Nice. Is he running you towards that rack or are you good? No, he's. I'm good, he's running out to sea. He's trying to get out of the boat, of course. Yeah, that's a good one, man. Well, for me, anyway. That was a nice one, that one. He was mixed in with all those guys. He 25 like he was about pounds 25, 25, 30 pounds. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Cool thing about fishing in the Gulf is usually any kind of structure you find, any kind of relief you find is gonna be holding the fish. Did you say that they like to go down and just kind of lock on the bottom? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they'll just, you know, walk around just like a dog. And then until they re it looks like you put the wood to them pretty good when you set the hook. So you might've felt it and went for the bottom. Well, aren't these fish known for being very docile when you go to boat them? Docile is not exactly the word I'd use. <laughs> they pull. Oh, without a doubt. They Plus definitely Plus you're trying to pull. lift that big flat head. And they're, all they're doing is this. Swimming. You're Love not gonna, you're not gonna yell at me if he gets away, are you? What kind of leader you got on there? Whatever was on Not it. big enough. <laughs> exactly. Not big enough. Probably 25. Eight. No, I want you to do this like a pro, Rush. In the corner. Oh, he's not liking it. I'm gonna rod hold this. Oh, holy there you crap. go. Crap, let's see you do that one again. <laughs> awesome. That's personal best right there, buddy. You like that? Yeah, he's a fat guy. If you don't know what a cobia is, it basically looks like a giant remora, almost a prehistoric shark. It's a nice one. That's a good one for here? I mean, it's average. Really? That's bigger than the ones you've caught though, right? Yeah, yeah, the other ones I caught are probably 15 or so. What's he weigh? They're, I know they're heavy. He's about 25 pounds. 25. But the way they behave and the way you catch them reminds me so much of our yellowtail at home. And they have so many different names too. Different yeah. lemon fish, people call them. Ling. That's kind of a regional thing, right? Carolinas, they call them a ling. Yeah. You'll find them offshore on floating stuff. You'll find them on wrecks. You can find them in deep water. You can find a cobia deep pretty much here. anywhere. Look at that motor on that guy. For a small fish, that's a big That's tail. why they pull so hard. And yeah. it's like all the way back. See how girthy oh, he is neat. all the way back? Yeah. Cobia, to me, kind of holds a special spot in my Florida fishing career, if you can yeah. call it that. All right, let's let that guy go. Awesome. Biggest there you one go, yet. buddy. Thanks. And the place where I caught my first one, caught my biggest. Reel down to the water until it's ripping drag. It's 
one of the most ancient forms of hide and seek known to man. And nobody knows how to play the fishing game better than the backcountry guides and offshore captains of the Florida Keys and Key West. Ready or not, here we come. Gonna run north towards some wrecks and look for some shrimp boats along the way. Okay. You know, around up into the, the Gulf? Yeah, we're going up in the Gulf. What was so unique for me about this particular trip was I've always heard about the shrimp boats. I've sort of seen them on TV. I've seen it happen in Louisiana. I've seen it here in Florida, but I've never witnessed it firsthand. So as a captain, as, as a guide, it presents a lot of great opportunities for my anglers. This is really cool. I've heard about this for years and years. I've seen it on TV. Tried to do it in Louisiana a couple times, got blown out, but I've never fished around a shrimp boat. They do it a little different in Louisiana, right? They're using big mullets. I think mullet's the ticket for them. I didn't actually get out and, you know, get to do it. I mean, you could do anything. I use this fishery here for fly fishing a lot. Some boats hold more fish than others. Uh, it depends on the area, depends on water color, time of year. So the gray ones are straight bonita, and the, the black yeah. fins will just look pitch black. The black, the, the black fins will look black. And a lot of times, you'll just drift away from the boat sometimes, yep. and you'll see black fins. Yeah. All of a sudden, they just come out of nowhere. Yeah, we get the same But usually, thing. you'll see a couple mixed in. Part of shrimp fishing is bycatch. These guys are trawling the bottom and they're catching a lot more than shrimp. At the end of their shift, basically, which is when the sun comes up, these guys are doing what they call culling their catch. They're taking everything that's not shrimp and they're throwing it overboard. And this serves basically as a giant chum bag. Doesn't take long. That's awesome. Putting that bait in the water from the net draws two prime suspects. Some, <laughs> some big bulls. What's all that blood in the water from? What, you rip one's gill already? I think he got stuck in the gill. It's either gonna be the bonita, which is a little tunny or a small tuna that you have here, and then it's also blackfin tuna. The thing about these fish out here too is they're really healthy from eating all this bycatch that comes out of the, off the shrimp boats. Fat, healthy fish and all that bycatch is going over the side. Oh, I lost mine. So these fish follow the boat day in, day out. They just kind of carry their own school with them, huh? Oh yeah. I'm about to double up here. They're trying to eat the hook that's sticking out of his mouth. <laughs> I want to see if I can not hook one, just skip it across Yeah, the good surface. luck with that. It's funny, man. The minute the, the head of the iron comes out of the water, they don't want it. Gulf of Mexico, Bonita. It's another one of those fish that gets a bad rap because they're not the best to eat, but they sure are fun to catch. And they make excellent shark bait. Yeah. The Bonita were everywhere. Every shrimp boat we fished, we threw a little bit of chum and it was instant surface action. How many of these do we want, Rush? Uh, if we're gonna do some serious shark fishing, I'd keep about seven or eight. I don't think this guy was going anywhere. Oh. Ouch. Uh, one thing I like to do when I go out to these shrimp boats is keep a few bonitas for bait. So there's a ton of wrecks out here we can come and fish one day. It is unbelievable Look how, how big that bonita are. is. Though. It's huge. You saw him taking string off of this. A lot of world records were taken out here. Before you knew it, there was pilchards blowing out of the water with these little tunas in hot pursuit. It was really cool to watch. God, it's so much fun coming out here with artificial and fly. The fly thing sounds like a lot of fun. Take this guy for some of the sharks tonight. Yes, sir. That's gonna be a good time, dude. I remember being a kid growing up, camping on the islands, and we'd have a shark rig out, and you would just get so geeked up over these sharks. You know, I when you're 10 years old, 12 years old, big sharks, teeth. I mean, we loved it. Because the Gulf is such a strong fishery for shrimp, a lot of the wrecks you're gonna find out there are of course gonna be shrimp boats. As you're running from shrimp boat to shrimp boat to look at your plotter and stop at a wreck or two in between. You know, whenever you're not looking for an amberjack, they're, they're bound to show up. Oh, what an eat, oh no. Was that a snapper that came up with it? That's oh, a good possibility. Captain Rutch, my minnow got eaten. They'd get fired up. 
They are fired up. Damn, it is amazing how strong these things are. Yellowtail just won't hang out like this. Like they will a little bit, but the way that these guys just sit around the boat is something really different for me. It's cool. Dude, it's gonna be so much fun camping tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Just hopefully the bugs aren't bad. I'm not looking forward to that. One of the things I tell my friends back home about fishing in Florida is just the availability year round of big fish. Captain Rutch? Yes? Um, I need some help. I'm a little preoccupied over here, buddy. Yeah, but this fish is gonna hurt me. <laughs> these big amberjacks, you know, they prowl these wrecks and structure spots and they're really abundant. What do you got there, Rush? Some smoked fish dip. <laughs> this is what they look like before they go in the package. <laughs> look at that bad boy. That's a lot of fun on a surface plug. This right here is the biggest difference between your fishery and mine. You got stuff like this on tap all year round. BDOutdoors.com is your one-stop source for all things fishing, boating, and outdoors. Stay dialed in with current fishing reports, breaking news, and our extensive library of how-to tips. You'll learn about rigging, fish cleaning, boat maintenance. We have recipes for seafood, a game, cutting edge videos, and gear giveaway contests. It's all free at BDOutdoors.com. As close as you're gonna get to a sure thing for catching billfish is Guatemala. They're here, man. This has been a 20 year run, buddy. These things haven't left, there's no cycle. When it comes to sail fishing, this is the real deal. The amount of sailfish here is ridiculous. Local knowledge is brought to you by Andro's Boatworks. Adventure never ends. Must add hooks. Defining fishing hooks since 1877. Aftco, the American fishing tackle company. Costa, see what's out there. And by Casa Vieja Lodge. Experience five-star angling in tropical Guatemala. As a kid, we used to camp out on these islands and you always like to go back to your roots a little bit. What did you like to do as a kid? You love the shark fish. There is nothing cooler than catching a big shark when you're seven and eight years old. This one, this one's hooked up. <laughs> that one's stuck. There is no shortage of sharks around the Marquesas, let me tell you. You got gloves in here somewhere? Yeah. You know, in fishing, no matter how much of it you do, Rush and I have both done plenty of fishing. Sometimes it looks like we're good at it and it's graceful. The reality a lot of times is very different from that. Hold on, he's going under, he's going under the boat. Can, can you get him back or should we walk him up around the bow? I, mean, I can go on Dan's boat. Yeah, just be careful, it's slippery. We hooked this fish, it went crazy. It ran up the side of the Andros. We're chasing around the side of the Andros. Oh no, you might be back on the other boat. Okay, let me go back this Come way. Come over me. It went under one anchor line, over another anchor line, down the side of the boat. We need those things under our boat. <laughs> Usually when someone invites you out on a badass boat like Dan's boat, you kind of want to show them you're a boat guy, you know what you're doing, you're a captain. No, we're so wrapped up. Here we are, the first night we're invited to stay on this thing. We've got half of Dan's boat wrapped up in braid. We're trying to cut off his anchor line with braid. I'm about to lose a finger. We're all screaming at each other. I turn Here, it. you want me to climb out there? Hold this for a second. We're using iPhone lights. I mean, you could really tell we were pros at this point. Hold on, just don't reel. I'm not doing anything, he's taking line. No, backwards, backwards. Go backwards, buddy. Just, just fall back If you on, can. Pull it out of gear. Everybody on board had to get involved. We had to get the dinghy out, uh, jump on board, and it turned into a total cluster. That was my good, that was my good group, grouper hook. Uh, I don't know how happy the crew was with us. I think you'll recover. 6-2, uh, what time is it? <laughs> it's uh, 8 o'clock. Not bad. There's steaks back on the big boat. I think when you're growing up, 
every kid, I know I did, dreams of finding treasure. The idea of treasure hunting, I mean, just, it's a sickness. It's, it's gotta be a disease. If one thing is for sure after spending time with Dan, his crew, seeing the museum, and really seeing the determination and talking to him about some of these other locations outside of the States, I know that Dan is gonna find his big score and I can't wait to see what he turns up.